precious name of Jesus and welcome to Choices. What a great day to be alive. On behalf of Choices, we say the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Amen. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Stay tuned with us as we discuss a very, very important topic choices. Don't go anywhere. Pull a friend together. Amen. Get the family together and God bless you. This evening we want to discuss the interesting subject of uh, agreement. Uh, agreement by definition means to come into harmony regarding a matter of opinion or feeling. And it's important to know that where there is agreement, there is power. Why agreement generates strength, encouragement, success, even defense. In agreement, faith is added to faith. And in so doing, we are able to overcome our limitations. If agreement is going to be possible, there must be friendship, humility, and the priority because these things are critical to the process of agreement. When there is a nexus among these, agreement is more than possible. So this evening we will attempt to discuss this topic in the context of the words of Jesus in Matthew 12 and the words of Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29. Gentlemen. Agreement. As we look at our nation and our region, we look at our, our families, we look where we live in our community, and all of us, I'm sure, are concerned about not just the conceptual notion of agreement, but we would like to see an agreement, the benefits of agreement, flowing along like a mighty river through the length and breadth of our nation. There are some who have limited the words of Jesus to a religious content, and um, that is uh, a severe limitation. So when this accountant, Matthew, documented what Jesus was saying in Matthew 12, he understood then that the words were so powerful that they could not, uh, should not be limited only to the religious sphere. He was speaking policy statements. Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. This is the NIV. King James says, shall not stand. Now this, this principle here, it was true then, it is true now. Mm -hmm. In kingdom whether it be a home, whether it be in the community, the nation, whether it be in an organization, if we will, anything that is divided against itself cannot stand. So this is not only true, in, as, as folks would say, in a Christian sense. This is a universal principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you are a rice farming family, for example, and there you have one vision that in this family, this year, we will extend our acreage and another equal partner of the family comes with the idea and says, you know something, we are going to diversify and we are going to 
um, instead Ru <coughs> Hassel. And we will take some of the land that we are planting right on and we are now going to cultivate Hassel. Except there is agreement. One wants rice, the other one wants Hassel. <laughs> Except there is agreement. We are talking about no longer a vision. That there is an interesting prefix. DI. It means two. <coughs> and wherever there is a division, wherever you have two visions, you have a division. That is true in the family, it is true in parliament, <laughs> it is true wherever you meet. If you all are looking at the dockery, you know, the grenade, <laughs> and you guys sit down to drink, and you decide you want to drink from the bottom half, and the man want to drink from the top half, you have problems. <laughs> division. Division. Once you have two visions, you have division. So Jesus said, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. So it doesn't mean it, 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 you can have the best intention, the best um, scholars lined up on your team. If there's division, if you're not, uh, if, if, if you divide it against yourself, the end result is catastrophic. It will not stand. It will be ruined. Corporate success is a necessity for every community. No community could actually stand and survive without corporate success. I, and I like how you have described it, Bishop, how, how you explain the word kingdom divided against itself it just cannot stand. So if we are hoping to have a community to stand, uh, a home, a family, whatever it is, the necessity for corporate success must be there. It must be the desire of everyone that we will have to make it together. If not, we will all drown. It's like as, as, as if you're, you're, you're in a deep sea and no one man alone can make it. We just need each other to get out. So what are some of the ingredients that are necessary, preconditions that are necessary to create an enabling environment uh, for, the, for agreement? I, I think one, one, one of the, um, I think humility um, is important and the, the whole concept of humility is pivotal to what um, uh, Pastor Sana just said. And in, 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 when we look at humility, we must come to the, to the understanding that everyone has something to contribute. And so if you can't stop to listen to people um, and you dismiss them as not having anything to say, that in itself is a recipe for, for confusion and therefore one has got to reach to that place where they must understand that you know everyone has something to contribute and we should be humble enough to hear what they have to say because at the end of the day that contribution might, might save an entire nation. Where does that come from? How do you attract that into your life, into your um, skill set, humility? I, I think that, that has it's grounded in, in one's relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I I don't believe that um, in today's society people understand this concept of being humble. You know, everybody wants to be a Lord unto themselves and, and to be seen as powerful. But when we take into context the whole the, the bigger picture you know what it is we want to achieve then one needs to humble oneself in order to ensure that the vision is sold to the others and that there will be some amount of cooperation togetherness in you know being established in order to achieve what we set out to achieve is humility equal to weakness no, no. no. So why is it folks are running away? Something is, something, 
and apparently humili um, humility, the whole notion of humility, does not appear to be as attractive as arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Bishop, to my mind, humility comes out of a, a heart for service, a, a desire to serve. And sometimes, some of us, we see positions not as an opportunity to serve, but an opportunity to lord it over over others. But all public service, all work, all giftings that God will have given to us, it is for us to have an opportunity to serve others. And if we can see that we are servants unto people, servants on behalf of God, to be a facilitator, to be a blessing to others, then this whole issue of arrogance, when it starts to, when it wants to creep in, you remind yourself, I'm a servant of God. I'm being called to serve people. And once you're a servant, you will you try to help them. You know, you have mentioned, uh, you, you, you made a reference there, I'm a servant of God. Something unfortunate has happened where this title, this description, somehow it has um, been relegated to only religious people. But if you are an engineer and you understand the whole notion of why you are an engineer, yeah. you are a servant of God. Yes. 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 If, if you are doing your engineering work in a way that will benefit humanity and benefit the community, you do it not because uh, of your pay, you understand that what you have yep. is God given. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you're police, that's a very powerful, a very powerful, when you become a police, you put on a uniform, very powerful uh, person. If you understand that you're, you're not only backed by the laws of the land and by the coercive power that you have with gun and all and kinds of things. If you understand that there is another power available to you and you are a servant of the people, a servant of God, your whole work will be different. I believe it is, that is a critical issue you're talking about there in terms of understanding. And when we come into that understanding, I believe it will influence our thinking and ultimately influence our actions. As we spoke earlier about the definition, coming into harmony of an opinion, of feeling, uh, talking about agreement as a process, I believe more and more we have to demonstrate humility. And starting in the home, starting at our workplaces, wherever we go, so it will be seen it would be it would be known and it will also influence others around us. Humility, we we you still uh massaging that. You know, Matthew same Compton think oh, Compton have an eye for detail. He 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 you know he was called while he was serving him as a public um, working with the tax department of the of this day. Jesus said, Come, 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 follow me. Mm -hmm. He writes a, a very um, interesting account when he said, one day they were, the disciples of Jesus, they were gathered together, this is in, 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 in Matthew 20, and one of the, um, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down past the fame of him. You know, the disciples were there, Jesus, and looking at humility. And she came, the protocol was correct, she respected him, she, she bowed, she knelt, and he asked her, what is it you want? And she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. This lady had clearly well um, sort this thing out in, in her head. I want my boys not only um, in this life but in this kingdom. I want them to be top dogs, you know. I don't want them. They must not be ordinary dogs. <laughs> right there. It's amazing how people, the constructs that they have in their mind. Yeah. 
You might think everybody ordinary, but people have their desires. And Jesus listened to her. And he asked, you don't know what you're asking, he said to her. And Jesus said, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? No. He, he took her to the cross. But she didn't know about the cross yet. And they said, we can. These guys later on we discovered these guys that disappeared from the seas, you know, <laughs> when the pressure was. But we didn't, we, we, I want us to get to the place. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from the cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. I wish you could stay here. So some of us are fighting for positions. I, I have said, I, you know, over and over and over, it's based on this. If you fight for something, you have to maintain yourself. If you fight for a position and you get it, you have to maintain. And some, some people maintain their position by subterfuge, by terrorism, by slander. You see, maintenance is very high. You know, look at the plane on the runway. Look at the plane. The next time you go to the airport, a plane on the runway. Look at all the service equipment that is available, mm -hmm. you know, to make that plane fly, fuel tankers, engineers, blah, 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 and all those kinds of things. Look at the bird standing right there at the airport. You have no, nothing around there to maintain. That bird was made to fly. Yes. You know, you, you've mentioned something there that I've never seen when you mentioned that Jesus said um, those positions... Um, They've been prepared. They've been prepared. And, and, and I'm trying to connect that to, to our discussion in terms of leadership and preparation because um, there are people who may want to aspire to high offices, high positions, but um, there is no preparation. And uh, if you're not prepared, you're going to make a mess. You know, as, as, as a friend of mine like, he likes to say, you'll make a mess. And therefore, if you are going to aspire for a particular position, one has to spend time learning what you have to do and, and recognizing that you know you, you will be required to serve and to serve people because as a servant of God, by extension, you're a servant of the people. And um, if, if you don't understand that and you are in the self-service mode where you're serving yourself, you will make a mess. That's why preparation should be done to individuals who enter into families. You just, just walk into a family and decide, or just wake up and say, I want to get married. There must be some preparation. Preparation should be done to persons who hold public offices. They must have preparation. If I should just squeeze this agreement definition a little more, you know. We were in a season recently in Guyana where a lot of us, we squeeze the coconut Kush, kush, get all the milk out of it. No, no. the people buy it. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. The people buy it. Can't go for it. It's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. Because, you know, we should really go back to our, you know, cultural <laughs> thing and great and so on. Oh, but <laughs> listen to me. Listen to me. They say in, in agreement, there is the absence of incompatibility. There's absence. There's nothing like that. Persons, you must be compatible to enter into marriage and so on. Listen, in very many situations we are entering to in, in government, in, in parliament and so on, people approach this thing as though it's a moot. So they have, a, they have an obligation to oppose and an obligation to, to, affirm. to affirm. But no, we have to take a rational position and allow our points to flow and come to the best conclusions. That's, that's not um, to oppose, the deliberate attempt to oppose is not agreement. Recently, I was, I was reading this world-renowned management guru, John Maxwell, and he, in one of the chapters he was dealing with the whole issue of finding agreement. And he made an interesting point that I would like to share with us. He said, lots of times, all we look at and all we can see is the 99% of issues that we do not find compatibility or we don't agree on. And all we do is to emphasize that. 
and we all are living in the same space, in the same environment, and uh, emphasizing that becomes futile and waste of time because you will still need to find some form of agreement. And this is what he suggested. He suggested a concept he called 101%. And this is how he explained it. He said, why not find that 1% of issues or issue that you all agree on? And why not give 100% of energy and effort to get that done? And I said, wow, I, it touched me personally as I deal with my own home, my work, my community. And I thought it's a fantastic concept. So I want to share it with us. I wish I could have put my name <laughs> on that statement <laughs> all, to say that, that that came from me. That's a powerful idea. Absolutely. A very, very powerful idea. I'm glad you mentioned it, you know. So here was, here was Jesus, as we continue looking at this whole question there of humility, he had this impossible regress, and he said, these places that y'all are trying to fight for, mm -hmm. that they belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my fathers. They are some mm -hmm. uh, positions, you jump high or low, um, they are prepared, they have been prepared for different ones. Now, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers, mm -hmm. and Jesus called them together and said, you know, I often, oftentimes when I read scripture, especially Jesus, his, his interaction with his disciples and with the community, you would notice he would have made, a, or he, yeah, he would have made a statement or statements in the public domain. And at the end, he would hold a seminar for his disciples, where he took time to explain to them what he meant mm -hmm. uh, because they could deal with it. Now he said to them in verse 25, you know, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. He was making, it's amazing that Jesus <coughs> had an understanding of his world. Jesus offered contextual leadership. Some of us, we are only interested in um, what is in the, the local area. But Jesus understood not only that situation, he understood what was happening in the wider environment. Very, very important kind of leadership he was offering here. So he made a reference. You know, so you think we didn't study Paul 100, but he was speaking about, he was really speaking about agreement. Mm -hmm. He was speaking about how people lord it over others. And he said, this is the practice. This is the conventional wisdom. This might even be the standard in the world. Not so among you, not so with you. Instead, and we are really talking about um, why is it people prefer arrogance above humility? He said instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant. Pastor, you've asked a question earlier, if humility is equal to weakness. And um, in just backing up a little bit in verse 23, Going back to the statement that Jesus made, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared for my, by my Father. To me, that is such a good example of humility, uh, giving credit to his Father. And we see a great example in the Lord Jesus here, demonstrating humility. You know, when you are humble, God is delighted in you. In you. And his grace and mercy is always upon you. Here what the Bible says in Micah 6, 8 about God and humility. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So when, when, you, walk, when you are humble, you open yourself to, for favor. Favor not only from God, but from your uh, from others around you. Yeah. Because they see that you are willing to learn. And you have the tendency to agree 
to advise. You know, so humility, humility, to my mind, it has a kind of attraction, you know. Um, it, it attracts uh, as against arrogance that, you know, you can be, you can be repulsive. And so, you don't have to spend too much time looking at the, the reaction of, of, of persons with respect to the two positions, humility and being arrogant. Um, someone who's arrogant, from the time you, you come through the door, people start to look in a different direction and, uh, and um, <laughs> you know, and you, you become repulsive, like a reproach. And therefore, um, if you're really looking to, to, to be of service to people, if you're really looking for persons to come around you, um, it is important that you demonstrate um, humility because humility attracts. Yeah, One of the yeah. things that is necessary in terms of agreement and two parties trying to really find common ground, and I think it's, it comes out of humility as well, is uh, it has to do with our words or what we say, and not just only what we say, but how we say it. What we say, we can't try to win somebody that is offended. I hear, I heard that from the thing Dr. Pepe last weekend. We had that said we can't try to win an offended brother. So we have to be very careful with what we say and, and the type of words that we use because it makes no sense. You, you you just can't have agreement if the other party is offended. So we need to break that that wall. Well, leadership one on one. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Pastor and Leadership 101. We need a major dose of Leadership 101. <laughs> we magnify our differences. We sensationalize it. We allow those who have the opportunity to put our differences in the news, they do that. But what we heard here tonight can work in your home, at your workplace, in your community, and in the nation. Let us find the one thing that we agree on <laughs> and give it 100%. We'll see you next week. God bless you. We thank you for being part of Choices. Remember, you can join us at First Assembly for any of our regular weekly services. I am Salisha on behalf of the set reminding you that your whole life is the sum of your choices. God bless.